bowed down with sorrow, O eyes that long for sight. There's gladness in believing in Jesus, there is light. His peace is like a river, his love is like a song. His yoke's a burden never, tis easy all day long. Come, come unto me. Come unto me. Let's sing together as we celebrate the life of our brother and elder, Joe Mays. When peace is like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea. Psalm 71. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me and be my rock of refuge to which I can always go. 
For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. My mouth is filled with your praise, declaring your splendor all day long. Do not cast me away when I am old. Do not forsake me when my strength is gone. My mouth will tell of your righteous deeds, of your saving acts all day long, though I know not how to relate them all. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteous deeds and yours alone. Since my youth, God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds, even when I am old and gray. Do not forsake me, my God, until I declare your power to the next generation and your mighty acts to all who are to come. Mr. Joseph Cephas Mays, Jr., age 91, of Murfreesboro, passed away on November the 25th, 2020. He was the son of the late Joseph C. and Ruth Clayton Mays. In 1953, Joe was introduced by mutual friends to Ruth Virginia Fisher, who was then a student at David Lipscomb College. Love blossomed quickly and marriage was proposed after only six weeks of dating. You go, Ruth. <laughs> Joe and Ruth married on September the 12th, 1953 in Detroit, Michigan. He served the congregation at North Boulevard as a faithful member, deacon, for over 30 years as an elder. He'll be remembered by many for his visits and prayers before, during, and after their own or loved one's surgeries and illnesses. Joe is survived by his wife of 67 years. 67 years. Ruth Mays. Children Jenny and Carol, Joe C. Mays III, and David and their families, 11 grandchildren, nine great-grandchildren, all of whom he was so proud. The grandsons will serve as pallbearers later today. There's more biographical information located in your program about the life of this great man, but I've been given the greatest honor of my life to be able to say a few words, and, um, and I will get through them. I'm um, privileged to remember the very first and the very last words that were said to me by Joe. My guess is it's not that difficult to remember the first words that were said because he probably said them to all of you, and those were, hey. <laughs> he said that to me in 2001 when I came to interview for this position that I felt that God might be calling us to. Those were the first of not lots of words, but several words over 20 years of friendship. I'll get to the last words that he shared with me in just a moment. The greatest gift I've given, I'll be given this holiday season, was a call from Lee Bolden. Lee called and said, hey, Joe's gone to the hospital, and if you'd like to visit, this is your chance, because you can't visit where he's living, but you can go and visit here. So I dropped everything, and I left and drove to Stonecrest, and I went in and waited for my turn, and we sat there for about an hour. And it's a gift that I will... Um, cherish forever. Joe and I talked and we laughed and I said, Joe, um, how long do you think you'll be here? And he said, well, I don't know. He said, I'm saying he said we played uh, charades for most of the time. But he did say, I, I got to go, uh, I got to get out of here to go get my haircut with Bob. And I said, you and Bob go get your haircut together? And he said, yep. And I said, well, how long can that possibly take, Joe? He said, oh, oh, it takes a while. He makes us look real good. And Bob, I'll have to, to tell you that as I walked out to the parking lot, I thought, who is it that I'm going to go get a haircut with when I'm 90? I hope that all of us have somebody in our life like the two of you shared. We talked about lots of things. We laughed a whole lot. Joe said, what words will you say? Speaking about this moment. And I said, Joe, probably too many. And he said, you got that right. <laughs> and then he said, just do, do me a favor. I said, what? He said, make them laugh. I said, well, I'm sure I can do that if I just tell stories about you, Joe. Um, so we continued to, uh, to chat. I'm going to show some pictures of what we talked about that day. We talked about our many trips to Mexico. This is Joe standing on the foundation of a home that he was about to build standing on a strong foundation of a home, something that Joe Mays knows a whole lot about. The images of Joe in Mexico were like this. I guess they're contemplating when their next haircut's gonna be. 
And then there were images like this, unbelievable. So many of us picture Joe in Mexico in these moments where he was the only one working in this picture as uh, he showed teens how to put in a garden. And home after home after home was built. And then Joe looked at me and he kind of giggled and he did this. Uh, and I said, what? And he said, you, you know, you know, you, Mexico. And I thought we're finally going to get this settled. I said, Joe, are you talking about that window? And he said, huh, yeah. <laughs> Joe and I were working on a house, and I wanted to learn how to put in a window, so we watched them put in the other window, and Joe said, here, let's put this in. Put it in. You can do it. So I picked it up, and he said, no, 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 turn it around. Put it in. I said, Joe, th that one over there is not turning. He says, no, no, you got it right. Put it in. I said, Joe, I don't think that one is there. He said, put it in. I said, Joe, really, you should go look at that one over there. That one's not the same way. He said, put it in, Skidmore. I put it in. And then we got it all nailed in. Bob Webb walked over, looked at it, and he says, well, congratulations, Skidmore. You put that window in upside down. I turned and I looked at Joe, and Joe crossed his arms and looked at Bob and said, I tried to tell him, Bob, he wouldn't listen. <laughs> and I said, is that what you're talking about? And he said, yep. And I said, you, you, you knew that we had done the wrong thing. You didn't do it on purpose. He said, no. I said, but you wanted me to take the blame? And he said, yep. And he laughed, and he laughed, and he laughed. Well, I'm glad we finally got that set straight. Joe loved the children in Mexico, so much so that in 2006, they surprised me in one of our evening skits. And I'll forever thank Zach Gannon, one of our former students, for this. There was a character on a commercial that looked a lot like Joe at the time. And so Joe dressed up like him and came in to some music and doing a funny dance like the character on this particular Six Flags commercial that some of you may remember. I was totally taken aback because I never would have imagined Joe doing anything like this because Joe was the guy that was on the building site putting in the windows and, and putting in the doors and putting up the walls. And I said, Joe, I didn't know that you had it in you. And he laughed. And the next night he came back out, did the same dance and left. And everybody enjoyed it. So much so that the next year we gave him the first of his many roles in our skits. This is Macho De Niro, uh, an evil villain who came and was stealing money, and he got put right by the end. He wanted to do his own makeup, and he loved these eyebrows that made him look mean, and he said one day, I can do my own makeup, except he painted them on the wrong way, and instead of going down like a villain, they were pointed up, so he looked surprised through the whole skit, and it made everybody laugh who came near him. The next year, he played a security guard of a museum. Only three pictures could I find of this character. I'm, I'm, I really want to find more. He had a set of keys. There's about 200 keys on there. And he had one line. His line was supposed to be to say, yep. But he could never remember his line. He would say, nope. Or he would say, huh? Or he'd look at me and look in the script, and he could never remember his line. These are poor quality pictures, but they're all that remain uh, of that skit. The next year, he played Inspector Gadget. It's probably one of my favorite of his characters. There he is with the trench coat, and here he is with all sorts of gadgets, including the hat with the umbrella, or with a hat with an umbrella that popped out of it and a propeller that he could fly around on. This is that hat. It stays in my office, and we give it out every year to this day to the student that day who's shown the heart of a servant. We just simply call it the Joe hat. Well, the next year we amped it up, and he played Buzz Lightyear. And he had one line. He would run in and say, to infinity and beyond. And every day it came out, to infinity and back. <laughs> I would say, Joe, it's beyond. And he would say, huh, OK. The next day he walked up and he said, to infinity and back. Looked over at me and he said, oh, sorry. He said it four days the wrong way. Well, the next year, Carol outdid herself with her costume. Captain Jack Sparrow has a grandfather. Captain Joe Sparrow. So he was in the skit as a, as a pirate. Well, the next year, not to be outdone, he was the large green ogre Shrek. Oh, the kids loved it. Joe was a little tired every night after the skits. He said, that's the last time I'm going to be a big green man. And I said, oh, no, it's not, Joe, because the next year, Carol got him ready to play the Incredible Hulk, along with Zorro and Aquaman. He just had one line then. It was to say gracias, but he kept saying gracias. I said, Joe, it's gracias. And he'd say, sorry, gracias. 
The next year was Despicable Me, and he played Dr. Um, Nefario. <laughs> Dr. Nefario was notorious for riding around on a little scooter, and that was the happiest Joe Mays had ever been in his entire life. He ran over every one of us during practice in that, uh, on that scooter, honked the horn, and there he is with all of the minions. I don't know who's going to take Joe's place in our skits, but it's probably not going to be Bob, is my guess. <laughs> Bob was not very happy. Well, then Joe, following his stroke, was set to retire from North Boulevard, and we threw him a party, and they made a cake with all kinds of uh, all the characters that he had played. There they are. It was at that party that Ruth came up and said, you know, he wants to go back. And I thought, well, that's going to be impossible. And she said, well, I'd love for him to have something to look forward to. And I thought, is it possible? And I called Bill and I said, you know, Ruth wants Joe to go back to Mexico. Is that possibly going to happen? He said, I don't know. Well, I don't have time to tell the entire story, but a plan was put into place um, that we called Santa Claus is coming to town. We only told Bill and Carol and Jenny, Ruth knew. Uh, one American director at the City of Children was aware, and myself. Nobody else knew. In March, we started putting the plan into place, and we, we kept it a secret in March and April and May. In June, Bill walked into my office and put down some plane tickets for Southwest, and he said, Santa Claus is coming to town. I said, we can't let anybody know this, and nobody knew. June and July came, it came time for our trip, and I said, does anybody know? And nobody knows. Ruth, you've not told anybody, I've not told anybody. Nobody knew. And our skit was all designed around Buddy the Elf, played by me, who messed everything up. Santa was being threatened in the North Pole, so they moved everything to the south of the border pole to keep Santa, or to keep the Christmas safe from Ebenezer Scrooge and Jack Frost and all of the evil winter villains, the Grinch and others. I had told a story at the beginning of that week about how I was in the governor's mansion with my um, relative who was high up in the government at the time when I was a kid. I wandered too far and a security guard said, son, you can't go there. And the, my, my relative Steve stepped out and said, oh, no, 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 he's with me. And from that moment on, I could go anywhere I wanted because I was with somebody far more powerful. Well, the kids had heard that story from me on Sunday. The skit continued and Buddy the Elf kept messing everything up. And the day of our final skit, I got this picture from Bill in San Diego, leaving the airport, and I knew that it was really going to happen. In our skit script, it just said, got to a certain point and said, and the skit continues from here. And I said, uh, everybody said, what happens after this? I said, you'll see. Well, do you know? Yep. Well, what do we do? And I just kept saying, just trust me. Well, we got to know what's going to happen. Just trust me. But, but, but how does the story end? You're just going to have to trust me. But we need to know. You'll know what to do. The end of the skit, Sam Bagwell playing Scrooge, who also didn't know what was going on, said to me, Buddy, you're now mine. The North Pole is mine, and I'm taking over Christmas. And I said, No, I'm not. And he said, Yes, you are, because you now work for me. And I said, No, I don't. And I pointed to the back of the room. And I said, I'm with him. And Joe Mays comes walking in, dressed in his Santa gear, People kept looking, trying to figure out, who is that dressed like Santa? Then they thought, who is that that looks like Joe? Then they thought, that is Joe. And it was the greatest gift that I've been able to give to any human and will probably ever be able to give. Before the skit was even over, children were coming up and wanting to give Grandpa Joe a hug. His family popped out from behind the back. Everyone was stunned. Nobody could believe it. And in one of my favorite, this may be my second favorite picture of Joe and I ever taken, at the end of that skit, and to have Mr. and Mrs. Claus, and then so many pictures like this that were such a joy. And it was the first time at the City of Children that six of our shepherds had been present for one trip. Six elders on one trip. And then the next day, this photo was taken, <clears throat> which is my favorite picture, I think, that has been taken since I've been in ministry here. I know exactly what we're laughing at, but I'll have to tell you that at another time in another place. <laughs> but we sat there, and I just could not believe that it happened. And I told Bill, we actually pulled it off. This picture is now going to go above our sink, beside a picture of Tom and Ann walking up that exact same sidewalk. 
Well, I said, Joe, your, your days in Mexico may be over, but you're still going to be in our skits. And he said, uh, okay. And so he was Sully's dad, and he appeared by a video feed. The next year, he was future me, 70 years into the future. And we time traveled. The year after that, he appeared on our Greatest Showman circus posters. Joe continued to appear in videos for, for camp, kicking off the Olympics and bringing in our Olympic torch and representing the Arbor Day team for our camp a couple years ago. Joe's pretty popular with our students so much that he's got his own big head at the church league basketball games. Every Sunday morning, I made it my goal to get out of class and get down to see Joe and Ruth right down here on this pew right over here every Sunday. And if I couldn't be here, I called somebody and either FaceTimed or had them greet them, and it was a Sunday ritual. And then I realized that the days may be getting limited, so I need to go and see Joe over at Adam's place. So I went and saw him. This is right after he founded Jurassic Park, apparently. And then we went to go and see Joe and Ruth, and I would pop in for lunches. And we shared lunches about once a month or once every other month for um, until uh, this last one was taken the day, the, the actual day before Adam's Place shut down during the pandemic. We had one final lunch. My friend Ricardo came to visit, and we surprised Joe. Ricardo and Patty are watching today, right now on the live feed, thanks to our team who made that possible. And, Ricardo said, would you please tell this family that Joe Mays did more for the home with as few words as any human could possibly accomplish. They deeply love your family. One of my favorite photographs is when they wanted a milkshake and they didn't want their own, so they decided to split one, and I had them pose for this picture. Somebody asked me, what is the greatest advice that Joe has ever given you? And I said, simple. Sometimes the only language is prayer. Every year Joe prayed at the house that we built in Mexico. He would put his hands on the house and he would lead the prayer every single year. The year following his stroke, he wasn't able to talk. And I said, Joe, you can start the prayer and then Tom Beatty will finish it. And Joe said, I, I, can't, I can't do it. I said, Joe, just, just try. There are several that were there. Joe bowed his head, put his hand. He'd not said in a complete sentence the whole trip. And he said, dear father, Bless this home and the family that will live inside. Bless those of us who built it. He continued for a full prayer and said the entire prayer. Later that trip, he was trying to thank the team and he couldn't get the words out. He couldn't find the words. We were all gathered around and he was trying to say thank you for allowing this Santa trip to be possible. And then he just said, let's bow. And he bowed his head and started to pray and every word came out perfectly. The greatest advice that Joe Mays ever gave me was not something that he told but with something that he modeled. When you can't find the words, you just pray, and it'll happen. I found this yesterday. Didn't even know this picture existed. So, Joe continued to build homes, and every day, every year, he would give the keys to the home. Can you imagine the reunion that this was and the feast that awaits us all? So this is a, an image of Joe that most of us have, and this is one that I will have, and this is the one that all of us will have. Joe played lots of roles in Mexico, but it was the roles that he played for the people on these pews that mean the most and will change the, the course of eternity. The role of dad, husband, grandfather, great-grandfather, gardener, an elder. He played those roles so well. The last words that Joe said to me, you're probably wondering what they were. I said, Joe, tell me this isn't going to be the last time that I see you. And he just said, hmm, if not, I'll see you up yonder. And with that, I walked out of the room and I began to hum when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair and the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share, when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. I could almost hear Joe whistling it as he walked up and down the halls of the church office. There were lots of hymns. The best advice I could give to any student who's watching this, because I know some of our students are, it's very simple. 
find Joe-sized footprints and follow them because they will lead you straight to the foot of the cross. My challenge to you as I close my comments today, let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder, we'll be there. Joe, to the family, to Ruth, Jenny, Carol, to Joe, David, all the children, all the grandchildren, all the great-grandchildren, other relatives and friends and all of us here. I don't know exactly what happened the other day, but I've got a pretty good guess that Joe walked in and he was greeted by the Lord, who we like to think said, well done, good and faithful servant. And I'm sure he did. But I have to believe that God greeted him and Jesus pointed to Joe Mays and said, he's with me. And he took him to the throne of God and he stood before the creator of the universe. And God looked at Joe and he said, Joe, welcome to infinity and beyond. God bless you. No tears in heaven, no sorrows given, all will be glory in that land. There'll be no sadness, all will be gladness, when we shall join that happy band. No tears in heaven, no tears, no tears up there, no sorrow. Tears up there, sorrow and pain will all have flown. No tears, no tears, no tears up there, no tears in heaven will be known. To Canaan's land I'm on my way, where the soul of man never dies. My darkest night will turn to where the soul of man never dies. Dear that farewell, there'll be no tear dimmed eyes. Where all is up, and the soul of man 
I just have to say a few words about Joe before I lead you in prayer. Uh, we served together 25 years as a shepherd. And being that tight, being that close with godly men, sort of indescribable. It sort of brings you to a, a relationship that you, you normally just don't have. Uh, I can never forget, um, by the way, we got John here and, and uh, who was with Joe and Tom, um, and that was in 1980, I believe, that you all became shepherds together, John, and you all were really tight, you three guys, and you helped us in educating this congregation. I'll never forget it. Best move ever. Anyway, we were going through a, a remarkably difficult time as a shepherd. And uh, I'm sort of a warrior. Joe, he had the capacity to trust completely. Ruth, he, um, he told me that I'm not worried. The Holy Spirit's going to take care of us. Do you know that was the greatest lesson he gave me? And Joe Shulam talked about the Holy Spirit today. We are with the Lord, truly with the Lord. You got nothing to worry about. Matter of fact, in John chapter 6, at the end of the chapter, Jesus says, don't worry about everything. Your flesh counts for nothing. It's what's inside of you, the soul that's inside of you. So anyway, that gift, Joe became a tremendous confidant to me, a tremendous friend to me. I loved him. Wasn't hard to love, was he? Jenny, Carol, you two daughters, look at me. You rose to the occasion. You are lovely, lovely daughters to a daddy and a mama. And Joe, where's Joe? Joe, do you remember when Joe came down one Sunday morning, it was the second service, and he came up here and he says, I just want to say something to the full congregation. This was after the, everything was done, the songs and such. And he said, you know, the world, <laughs> the world would be better off if everybody had a daddy like my daddy. You remember? I sure do. Where's Nathan? There's Nathan. That's David's son. When I took Joe to get a haircut, we talk about what was going on. Of course, he had aphasia, which my father had aphasia, the inability to communicate. It's a terrible hole. But he could get something. We would, I would provoke him. I would push him and hit him. and Not, not hit him, but he just say, come on, let's do it. He talked about you. He talked about how proud he was that you have risen to dedicate your life to the Lord in ministry. You remember that. Honor it. Ann Beatty's not here. She's on Skype. But I wonder, I wonder what Joe and Tom are talking about right now. They were like that. So this is a sweet and sorrowful time just because of us being still here. The real, the real 
the real world is the next life. That's the real world. This is just, a, I assume it's just a, a ground to see how we get along together, how we um, work out problems. So I want to thank God for my brother Joe. So let's go to our Father. Our Father in heaven, we truly say, hallowed is your name. And trying to grasp the depth of you is impossible. We see all the creation and wonder at it. And yet you just spoke it into existence. You spoke it into existence. And then we rebelled. And you said, I'm not through with you. So you, through the Old Testament and to the New Testament, you finally gave us your son, Jesus. Jesus being in the entire Old Testament. You could see he was throughout the entire Old Testament. And then he came to empty himself of his Godhead and took on the form of a human being. He'd emptied himself and lived a life that was perf perfect. Oh my. I look at myself and I know who I am. But I thank you for the opportunity to have this desire to be with you forever. And Joe showed us that desire. He helped me in that search. So I thank you, Lord, for this man and his helpmate and what they have done here at North Boulevard and with their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. It'll be interesting to see how the story plays out. Thank you again for Jesus and thank you again for my brother Joe. In your son's name, amen. Every community needs a hero. And uh, Joe Mays was not only the hero for his family, and Jenny, we've had this conversation. I don't know if you realize how much Joe Mays is a hero to this congregation as well. Bob, you took away the quote I wanted to start with. When Joe the Third mentioned on one Sunday, um, I guess after the stroke, can you imagine what kind of world this would be if everyone had a father as I've had? I want to start by just saying, um, Joe, you and David, you live in different states. It's a little different for you. But I want to add an addendum now to that observation because I got to see Jenny and Carol take care of Joe and Ruth. And I've just thought, can you imagine what kind of world this would be if every couple had daughters like Jenny and Carol, oh my goodness. In a way, I've been preparing for this for 28 years because um, not long after I came in 1992, Joe would start to talk about his funeral. He would say, now make sure you don't say this at the funeral. Don't, don't tell them that story at the funeral. And he went through so many things that he told me not to say at his funeral that I'm, I'm really kind of nervous about <laughs> the fact that I know Joe can hear what I'm saying right now. How do you sum up the life of a man who was a legend, a hero? It's so hard to do. You know, all the little things about Joe come to mind. Just the simple, um, the uh, humming and the whistling, the uh, this number here. I can tell you in an elders meeting when Joe started tapping his pencil on the table, something was about to blow. You knew it was, it was gonna be bad. He didn't say a lot, but when he started tapping his pen, you knew he was about to say something and it was gonna be really, really strong. 
I think about Joe and some of the courageous decisions that Joe made. You know, Joe and a group of elders um, really weathered a serious number of storms at North Boulevard as North Boulevard went through a lot of changes. Um, in some ways, tracking along with the changes that have happened in the U.S. and certainly in Rutherford County, Joe and uh, that gang of elders may be led just if for no other reason by their age and their maturity and their wisdom. Joe and Tom working together in so many ways, they led us wisely and courageously and bravely so that North Boulevard uh, in 1992 was uh, in the 600s. Before the pandemic hit, we were uh, of 2,100 at North Boulevard and thriving. It, our numbers actually have even gone up since the pandemic. And a lot of that had to do with just the um, spiritual compass that Joe had, the sense of courage, the sense of direction. Joe was a father to North Boulevard. And so a couple of years ago, um, when Joe decided to retire as an elder, we really begged him over several years, don't do it. And he felt bad about serving as an elder because he realized with his aphasia, he wasn't able to do a whole lot. And we would tell him, no, just your presence, it just elevates the room. It, makes, it just makes the whole church realize um, that something really important is at stake. But I think not long after he retired, I don't remember when it was, but I asked the congregation, please stand up if you were ever visited by Joe Mays. And I think probably about 80% of the congregation stood. Literally hundreds and hundreds of people stood. And I'm pretty sure if there weren't a pandemic right now, uh, those of you who are online with us would be here and present. And um, we probably wouldn't have enough seats for all the people whose lives have been shaped by Joe. Joe was not just a dad to the four of you and a granddad and a great granddad. He was a dad to me as well. And I can't think of anyone who shaped my life more than my father. And I don't want to pick favorites, but it's just the truth. Tom Beatty and Joe Mays, who taught me what it was like to be a man and a devoted husband who adored his Ruth, his bride, as he would say, for 60 seven years. I've never spent more time in ministry with anyone than I have with Joe. And so Joe and I had the longest conversations. We had uh, Joe and Tom and I had lunch every, at least th two or three times a week, every week for years. You really get to know a guy when you vacation with him. We traveled overseas numerous times together. We did campaigns together. We would go on preaching tours together. You really get to know what a guy's made of. And, um, I don't know how to summarize Joe's life except for to say, again, a man of great wisdom, of great love, of great courage, and a great sense of humor. Joe was a family man, and his family will tell you about all the stories that he would make up and tell the girls and the boys growing up. All kinds of characters. Uh, a couple of years ago, Carol wrote down some of them, some of the stories that he would tell, Boo Boo the Clown, Hanky Cheese, Root and Toot, the pigs. He would come in and oftentimes he would just make up the stories to help the kids go to sleep. He was known to sneak down the hall and surprise the kids to scare them, to have a little fun with them. He would doodle in church in order to keep them occupied and keep them from uh, being so distracted they would make a lot of noise. He was a kind of father who was always outdoors, so he was always playing with the kids, building uh, igloos and snowmen with the kids, outside loving on the children, and as I said, that's how he treated North Boulevard as well. He loved North Boulevard. He was outside with North Boulevard. He spent his life serving North Boulevard. And that's one reason why so many at North Boulevard think of Joe as their father as well. People like Tim, people like me. And uh, in some ways, many people in the congregation. Joe was, um, I don't think you would mind my saying this, but Joe would sometimes confide in me that as he was growing up on the farm in Farmington, where he experienced so many stories that, that we have to be at the cemetery by four. Otherwise, this would be a really long service just, just to sort of pull together some of the great memories. Joe had a fantastic memory. He could tell you stories from when he was three years old. And when we would tell him they were always the same. They were consistently told. He told me one time that his dad would give him jobs and Joe would say, I'd go out and I'd try to do it. And he said, sometimes I just never felt like I could make my dad happy. And he said, I just always felt like I was never 
able to make him happy. And it, Joe, he said this to me one time. He said, I think I've spent the rest of my life deciding that I'm going to be a good man so I can make my dad happy. And I don't know what that was, but there was a drive in Joe. He was willing to listen to advice. He was willing to listen to other people's wisdom. But when Joe decided something was right, there was not anything, nothing, all the devil and all his demons were not going to stop Joe Mays when he decided something was right. And here's a story that's probably not been told very often, but when Joe was in Michigan, he was working with an insurance agent, and the insurance agent would um, send out bottles of alcohol as Christmas gifts to his clients. And Joe one year said, I just, I just don't want to be part of that. I don't want to do that. And his partner said, well, this is what we're going to do. This is how our business operates. He says it, it just helps people like us. It reminds us, reminds them of who we are. And you know, Joe Mays quit his job without another job and decided it's better to be unemployed than it is to work for somebody who puts you in a position where you compromise your position. And I've seen Joe make those kinds of decisions. One of my favorite all-time elders meeting memories, we had a, a family here that wanted their grandson anointed. He had cancer. They want him anointed with oil. And none of us had ever seen it before. We'd never heard of it. We didn't know you could do it. We were pretty sure we would be accused of you know, being liberals or whatever, whatever the accusations might be. So for a couple of weeks, the elders studied the subject. And I'll never forget one elders meeting. Um, Joe is looking at James chapter 5 where it says, if anyone is sick, let him call on the elders of the church, let him anoint him with oil and pray over him. And Joe said, he hardly ever spoke, and he just spoke up and he said, fellows, I'm looking right here at this verse right in front of me, and it says do it. So I'm going to do it, and I hope you don't mind. I'm going to do it in church this Sunday so everybody can see us obey the Bible. I hope you all are okay with that. And I just wanted to shout, not because I care about oil, but because I care about someone who just says, I don't care what anybody in the world thinks about me. If the Bible says do it, I'm going to do it. I got to, I got to serve under a guy like that who was so convicted that when he saw something was true, nothing was going to stop him from that. I can recall when um, we would have controversies at church. It may take a while for Joe to reach his position, but when he reached his position, it didn't matter who you were. If he thought he was standing for what was right, he was not going to back down. And he was going to stand in a way that was gracious, but firm and courageous and clear. I can't help but think that that's not one reason why North Boulevard has flourished, because it had men with that kind of courage. I recall one time preaching a sermon on racial issues at North Boulevard. And Joe came down after the sermon, uninvited, and decided to make a statement to the church. And I'll just be honest, I had no idea what he was going to say, and I was a little nervous because I wasn't sure what he was going to say. I didn't I had any idea what he would say. And he began to tell about what he had seen as a, as a boy growing up in rural Tennessee, the injustices he had seen. And he got teary-eyed, and he just said to the whole church, you know, it was a white church, almost completely white at the time. We've got some serious repenting to do of what we've done in the past. To have a man of his stature decide to get up and say, this is what we have to do as a church, never leaves you. It's something you never forget. Joe was that kind of man. He was also a man who, um, he just loved people. He really cared. I'll never forget when my son Jonathan had his surgery, brain surgery, as a six-month-old boy. Joe brought all the elders over to the house that, that, the night before the surgery. And he decided to anoint John's head with oil. And Joe, Joe, when Joe anointed with oil, you know, I would have just put a drop or two on. That's how the Catholics do it. Joe, I mean, he just, it was like pins oil. He just pulled it out in his hands. It would drip down his arms. He had lathered John's head up, had oil all over his body. And we just sat there and I just watched Joe as he prayed his soul out. He had just told me a few days before that, he said, listen, if, the, um, if this surgery runs into some serious money, I want you to tell me I'm going to pay the difference. Jonathan went in. We prayed. I remember one of the prayers that we prayed that Joe joined in on. He prayed one day Jonathan would be healed so thoroughly that we'd hear him say a prayer in church. It was brain surgery. We were concerned that it would leave permanent brain damage. 
The very first time Jonathan said a prayer publicly in a church service, the very first time, he was eight years old. I had just baptized him two weeks before, and he said the opening prayer at the Pepperdine Bible lectureships in front of 5,000 people. And I remembered the prayer that Julie, my wife, and Joe and others had prayed. God, let him pray one day in front of the church. And I just am forever grateful for a man of God whose prayer brought in a loving God to act that way in the life of my son. I don't want anyone to forget this. After Joe's stroke, he was at the uh, rehab hospital here in town, Trust Point. And I got a call, I think it was from Ruth. Ruth. I don't remember Ruth, if it was you who called or Bob or Nancy, I don't remember who called me. Said, are you gonna be at church this Sunday? And I said, yeah, I'll be there, I'm preaching. And whoever it was said, well, Joe wants to make sure that you're going to be there so you can help out. He's going to baptize somebody. Well, but Joe had aphasia. He couldn't even get out of bed. And I said, he couldn't speak. I said, who in the world is he going to baptize? He's baptizing his speech therapist. Joe Mays, with aphasia, unable to speak and walk, baptized his speech therapist right here in this baptistry right after his stroke. We don't ever need to forget that's the kind of man who led North Boulevard. By the way, he managed to pull off a few other things during that stroke. Not long afterwards, he was there, he was bedridden, and he had gotten some, uh, I guess Carol maybe had gotten some really nice cookies sent to the room, and they'd eaten a few of those cookies, and they set him over on the windowsill, which was on the other side of the the room from where Joe was in his bed. And um, Carol went home that night, and came back the next morning, every one of those cookies was gone. And she's trying to figure out where those cookies went, and she saw a trail of cookies going back. <laughs> and when she pulled the sheets off Joe, he had cookies all from head, all to toe, all over his body. He couldn't walk, but somehow he had figured out a way to get over to that cookie box, get all the cookies and bring them back and eat them in the bed with them. I mentioned that to him the last time I saw him, or one of the last times I saw him. And he giggled and giggled and giggled. He remembered it. He knew he did it, too. You know, we would visit together. I got so many stories, I'm going to get carried away from not careful. We would visit together. And I'm telling you, when you visit enough hospitals, you see pretty much everything. So um, uh, we would go in on, we went on on one guy. He was just completely naked when we walked in. He was lying on his back trying to decide how much of what Joe said I should tell you in this funeral. This might, this might go in the category of don't tell that at my funeral. We walked in and this guy was totally naked. And uh, when we walked in, Joe said, now you need to uh, put a towel over you or something. And as, as soon as we got him covered up, Joe looked at me and he said, so you ready for lunch now? And I, <laughs> we saw a lot of things working together like that. Joe was, um, he was unafraid. Um, We were in Egypt one time and we were on a ship. You were on that boat too, Joseph Shulam. And Tab, I think you might have been on that. And they decided to sick the belly dancers on us and we were all Christians. We were trying to hide from the belly dancers, but not Joe. (laughs) When the belly dancer came Joe's way, Joe got up and he starts doing the moves. (laughs) Oh my goodness. He was hilarious, Joe was, with the belly dancers. And so my favorite memory from traveling with Joe, I think, is the belly dancer. I was hiding under a table, and Joe was up there just having a ball with the belly dancers. And you know what? There's nothing Joe didn't know. So, again, I have to be really mindful of time. There can't be anybody in here who knows what this is. So I was really interested in the history of our fellowship, the Churches of Christ, a couple of years ago, or 20, 25 years ago. And we discovered the old home st- uh, place of David Lipscomb down, uh, it's down in Franklin County, out in the middle of nowhere. And I'd gone down there and I found the house is still there. And I knocked on the door. I asked the guy, has no one else ever been here? He said, yeah. He said, back in the 1970s, somebody came by and he told me where the cemetery was. It's back in the woods. So I went and got Joe, came back. And a couple of weeks later, we went down there. And as we we're walking through the woods, I said, Joe, I want to pick up something. This is where David Lipscomb grew up. And I picked, I, I saw this piece of metal. I picked it up and I said, I think I'll take this. And Joe said, oh, that's a, and I wrote it down. He said, that's a piece of a 1934 W2 uh, Threshmaster, probably a 32-inch Keck Gunnerman separator that was operated by a steam engine. I'd say 1934. 
I said, how did you know that by looking at this piece of metal? He knew, he knew everything there was to know about farm. One of my best memories is driving down the road with him and Tom, and Tom would look out the window and say, Joe, what is that? Joe would say, oh, that's an X master I'd say that's probably a 37. You remember they used to use that with that old thrasher would separate out that uh, grain? He could tell you just from looking out the window pretty much anything there was to know about farms and farm implements and so forth. Anyway, I don't know why I had to throw that in, just because every time I look at this, I think, how in the world did he know that from that piece of metal? A great man. He was one of the first elders to say at North Boulevard, make sure, he said this to me explicitly, make sure you don't neglect the Holy Spirit. We've neglected the Holy Spirit long enough. Don't neglect the Holy Spirit. He was one of the first men that said that when we pray, we need to lay hands on people. It takes some courage for an elder to say that back in the 1990s when you were considered a little bit off your uh, rocker to say things like that. He was one of the first ones at North Boulevard who said we needed to move to this location. I can recall when we were doing fundraising, Joe would be the, one of the first ones, Joe and Ruth, to make sure they gave a check, to make sure that the process got up and running financially. Well, you can see I'm out of time because we do need to get to the cemetery. And I want to say a prayer, but I just want to say this. I've just really racked my brain over what scripture to read. There's so many scriptures to read. But Psalm 15, which is a very short psalm, seems to me to be perfectly written for, um, for our hero, Joe Mays. So I want to read it. Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? who may live on your holy mountain. The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is right, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue has no slander, who does no wrong to his neighbor, casts no slur on others, despises what a vile person does, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his word even when it hurts does not change his mind, lends money to the poor without interest, and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things shall never be shaken. That is Joe Mace, a father in the faith, a father, a grandfather, great-grandfather, a father of Jesus, a deacon, an elder, a son, a brother, and a husband who loved his wife, Ruth. Let's pray. Lord, what a privilege to have had this man in our lives. And I pray, Father, that you'll raise up a thousand more just like him, that the world can be that better place, Father. We're thankful, Father, that for each of us, for the relationship we've enjoyed with Joe, and we look forward, Father, to the resurrection where we're reunited in a garden that has no weeds, no thorns, and no thistles. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for bringing us together, even in the middle of COVID. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
Chris will follow at Evergreen Cemetery. Thank you for coming.